Um, Maria said, my talk this evening is called Care, Cartographies of Power and Politics in Early Childhood Education and Care. And as an Australian, um, I, well, we always begin um, with acknowledge, acknowledging the country that we live on in Australia. Um, I live on a Wabakal country, so I always pay my respects to the Pamelong clan of the Wabakal country and their elders, past, present and future. That's the land on which I live and work and walk in Australia. Um, I think in New Zealand, my sister lives in Hamilton, I'm going there tomorrow to visit her, and she tells me that um, connections are with rivers and mountains, is that correct? So I thought, um, this is my sea because I don't have a river, and this is my mountain because <laughs> The, the, the stands of eucalyptus trees are my, are my land. Um, so this is the place that I'm, I'm connected with. And I found out very recently that my great-great-great-grandmother, who arrived in Sydney from England with her husband and her children in the 1840s, got on a donkey cart and went from Sydney up to a small town called Paterson, which is quite close to Newcastle. Um, and the maps are a bit... White maps are a bit dodgy, but as far as I'm, as far as I know and can tell, it's also a Wapakal country. So I have this, um, this my own little connection to, to sort through and work out there. I've only found that out quite recently. <clears throat> Sorry. So I've been wondering in this last week if we are actually having our own little Paris 1968 moment. You know, this moment that shook the world. Um, last week, my sister was in Paris, and she took this photo from the top of the Eiffel Tower, the yellow vests burning a, a, a cafe on the Champs-Élysées. We have children striking from school and marking, marching against their politicians um, because they're not, of not enough action against climate change. This is finally hitting the news now, but this came up on my Twitter feed. Um, it's cycling Idai in Zimbabwe in a place called Chimani Mani which is on the border of Mozambique. And thousands of people, as it turns out, it's only just starting to um, come to life, have died in, 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 that, in that cyclone. It's been incredibly destructive. And then, of course, the horror of last Friday here. And I thought, I can't actually present here without acknowledging that and uh, offering my, 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 my solidarity and my sympathy. So, in the face of this, I think, I mean, last, last weekend when I was working this, I actually had different, four, four different pictures. And I think this weekend I could probably find another four. And it's, so this, this, this 24 news hour, hour, 24 hour cycle of news and despair. So I think I've been wondering, actually, if we should, in the face of all of this pain, think about some optimistic thinkers. So people like, one of the people I lean on quite a bit is Rosie Bredotti, and she's an eternal optimist. She often describes herself as an eternal optimist. And I wanted to, I was inspired today um, by watching a conversation between Donna Haraway and Rosie Bredotti, where they talk about their long friendship, actually. They're friends, who knew? I didn't. Um, many years of friendship. And they talk with each other about what constitutes the possibility of going on. What constitutes the possibility of a feminist partial healing of this earth? Because we are always becoming with each other. We are sympoetic, making with, not autopoetic, standalone, self forming systems. Or as Rosie Bredotti puts it, we are in this together, but we are not one. And as Haraway puts it in her inimitable style, we are, in, we are entangled in tentacular knots. There are, these are also ideas that scholars such as Achille Mbembe has been working with. And this is a, a quote from his um, address to the Holberg debate last year in Paris, uh, in Sweden, sorry. And he says, ours is a time of planetary entanglement. We are, more than ever before at any other time in human history, exposed to each other. So we are in this together, but we are not one. We are entangled in tentacular knots. We are exposed to each other. This entanglement, this exposure, is not one. It is not equal. The entanglements, for example, are entwined with exclusionary practices, with exclusionary capitalism and global markets. And we need to ask, 
whose human and non-human bodies count and whose human and non-human lives matter? And to think with these questions, we need some, as Deleuze would call them, mobile concepts. So I just want to clarify just briefly what I mean tonight when I talk about cartography and also um, what I mean about power. So cartographies or nomadology, nomadology as Rosie Bredotti is talking about, power, these are some mobile thinking, some mobile thoughts. Um, in the summer of, um, in November of 2016, at the Summer Institute of the Antipodes in the Western Sydney University, I was really lucky I was in the audience when Rosie Bredotti gave a keynote speech. It was amazing. If you ever want to hear a great philosopher speak, oh, there she was. Anyway, drawing on Foucault, she asked her audience, what are we in the process of becoming? And she asked this as a way of thinking with and beyond histories of the present. So cartographies, as the word suggests, are mappings and genealogies that help us to understand the present as a combination of what we are seeking to be and the traces of what we are becoming. So Bredotti's use of cartographies as a form of genealogy are theoretically driven politically sustained mappings of a present we assume is changing. They are reading, they are a reading of the processes of power relations. Nick Rose also talks about this in his 2007 book, um, The Politics of Life Itself. He talks briefly about cartographies and he says, suggests that histories of the present, which, are which is the genealogical work, sought to disrupt, to make space, to remind us of the contingency uh, and the non-necessity of the way things are, but we are already living in disruptive times. Okay, as Nick Rose puts it, times of maximal turbulence, which is a wonderful phrase. So perhaps then, we can instead work towards these modest cartographies, these multiple mappings of multiple histories and multiple futures and that might serve to intervene in new ways. So to me then, cartographies push out the edges of genealogy. They remain historically located and they remain theoretically driven and political, but they also continue to map through and across the present. They ask, how did we come to be who we are today? That's Foucault's question. And they push the boundaries of this a little further then to also ask, what are we seeking to be? And what are the traces of that becoming? In terms of power, I'm coming from a Foucauldian position there, and that, that is power is relational, it is networked, it's not always top down, sometimes it is, it's, 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 um, it's um, not necessarily negative, it's productive in its relationships, and it only exists when there is freedom and the possibility of resistance. So, that's the context in which I'm interested in care. Care is the invisible and taken for granted work of all teachers, but especially those of us who teach in the early years settings. Care is an assumed good, as benign. Care is power. Care is rejected and ignored sometimes in our attempts as a field at gaining some professional and political recognition. My key argument is that thinking and acting with care is powerful and as a field we can't take it for granted. So how do we take this very slippery word and make it hold some ground to find some grip and some bite. So I listened to Donna Haraway speaking about companion species um, a few years ago, and that inspired me to think about the idea of sitting with the problem, of staying with the trouble, okay? You know, that's the title of her book. So for me, the, tr the problem is that I believe care matters deeply to all who engage with children in the early years. It's part of our professional identity just as education or learning and pedagogy matter. But we have this growing language for talking about those things for education and pedagogy and the importance of learning in the early years. But care is sometimes, or quite regularly actually, actively marginalised. So it's juxtaposed as, oh, we don't just care about kids, we're also teachers. Um, and so it easily becomes invisible. But I think, crucially, that teachers of all ages from early childhood through to tertiary teachers, care. It's part of our professional work. We care for our children, our students, our, our discipline, our world, okay? And to push that aside enables a silencing of quite a significant aspect of our professional identity. 
So there's a continually growing library of research and writing about the education in early childhood education and care. And so while there's certainly been people writing about care, I'm not, um, it, not saying that this has been completely marginal and invisible, there are certainly people writing about care in early childhood education and care. It's not, it's, it's not as well thought through as other aspects of our work. So for example, there's a book that you can get that's called Key Concepts in Early Childhood Education and Care. And it's written by an English professor, a um, very well-known English professor. And you, in that list of key concepts are things like pedagogy and assessment and brain science and child rights, but not care. So care is not, in that book of key concepts of early childhood education and care, care is not considered a key concept. So the reasons for this, as I said, are good. They're varied. There's many of them mostly to distance our undervalued work of a predominantly female workforce from the apparently natural and motherly work that we do as educators to focus on the value of um, the educative aspects of their work. We can align ourselves with the political clout that brain science provides and the economic arguments, um, you know, those future cost benefits of whether we have early childhood education or not. Um, but what would happen if we wanted to prioritise care again? What if it were to be defined as a key concept in early childhood education and care? What would this look like and what language would we use? So to continue thinking about this, I'm trying to hold the idea of care up a bit and look at it from various angles and perspectives and try to find a way to articulate its place in early childhood education. And one key problem with that, of course, is how do we do this without sounding naive? How do we do this really important work without sounding like we want to head back to just being nice ladies who play with children all day. Okay. Um, so this is especially important, again, in a, in a field that's overwhelmingly dominated by women. And I also believe in, an, in a time of this new ontological turn to the ideas of post-human and the new materialism, relational ethics, affect, relational ontologies, that it's really important to be engaged with and understand that thinking about care is both ancient and new. As Zoe Todd, who is a Canadian First Nations scholar, reminds those of us, or those of us like me who are um, non-Indigenous, who are white, Australian, she's a Canadian First Nations scholar, and she reminds of those of us working with these ideas that it's so important to think deeply, this is a quote, about how the ontological turn with its breathless realizations that animals, the climate, water, atmospheres, and non-humans like ancestors and spirits are sentient and possess agency. That nature, culture, human, and animal may not be so separate at all, after all. We have to think deeply about how it is that our use of those concepts might in themselves perpetuate the exploitation of indigenous peoples. And Zoe Todd cites her First Nations colleague, um, Dwayne Donald, here, in reminding us that ethical relationality is an ecological understanding of human relationality that does not deny difference, okay, but rather seeks to more deeply understand how our different histories and experiences position us in relation to each other. Okay? This form of rel relationality is ethical because it does not overlook or invisibilize the particular historical, cultural, and social context from which a particular person understands and experiences living in the world. It puts these considerations at the forefront of engagement across frontiers of difference. And I come back quite a few times to this idea of ethical relationality in my talk. So what is care? Okay. Um, and how can we be thinking about ethical relationalities and care? This is a really very limited and somewhat speculative sort of account of 30 years or more of research um, on care. Once you start reading outside of early childhood about ethics of care and understandings and philosophies of care around, um, across, across the um, scholarship, across the academia and philosophy, it's massive, 30 years at least, of people thinking and theorizing and working out what this thing called care is. Okay, so I'm going to be missing bits here. But I, I, I often begin um, with this um, very well-known definition of care from Joan Tronto. It's actually self-cited from um, Joan Tronto and Bernice Fisher from the early 90s here. But they say, on the most general level, we suggest that caring be viewed as a species of activity that includes everything that we do to maintain, continue, and repair our world 
so that we can live in it as well as possible. The world includes our bodies, ourselves, our environment, all of which we seek to interweave in a complex, life-sustaining web. So there is some consensus um, um, amongst the, me, most of the feminists, mostly, who are talking about a philosophy and ethics of care. There's a bit of two waves of, of, of um, work happening. It started in the 80s and 90s with Carol Gilligan and Nell Noddings, um, who were really talking about bringing women into this equation and talking about a philosophy of care and an ethic of care. Um, they were writing to put women into this picture. Noddings in particular has been influential in education, and some of you might have heard, heard about Nell Nodding's work. Um, and she wrote a paper in 2012 describing care as, a, as an exchange, um, being an expression of need by a receiver or the student of care, which is responded to by the carer or the, um, the giver of, of, um, or the educator, and then recognised and acknowledged by the receiver or the student. So it's a, it's a, it's a dyad relationship going backwards and forwards. However, this relationship remains between two people. Okay, so I think that that's fairly limited. It's two, two, two people, the, limit, the, um, the receiver and the carer. So as with Joan Tronto, Selma Seven, Hughes and Claire Cameron, Peter Moss, uh, I think it's actually quite important to move away from Nell Nodding's ideal of care as, and that dyadic relationship, because I think that it's all too easily reduced to maternalism and that mother-child relationship um, that is so dominant in early childhood. So in the 1990s, the work for feminists such as Joan Tronto and Selma Seven, they built this case arguing that the care work done in formal and institutional settings like early childhood um, is not simply a reduction, reproduction of the family. It's not a reproduction of the home. Um, and we can't actually also even take for granted what's happening in homes. So Tronto argues that care is relational and that we must, in institutional settings, think about power so what, is the, what are the power relationships happening in that setting? What is the purpose of the institution? So what is, what, are the, what is the purpose of that care institution? And what are the particularities of that institution? Okay, so she's thinking about how rela human relationships are understood to be diverse and to be plural, and therefore very specific to a context. Selma Seven Hughes makes her case for care to be understood as inherent in socio-political context and democrat of democratic citizenship. And her work encourages us to think of caring institutions as microcosms of our wider social and political context, suggesting that new vocabularies are necessary for understanding social engagement and relationships of care. And as with Toronto, Sevenhusen reasserts the need to resist a feminization of care and instead focusing on care as fundamental to our human agency. So more recently, with the work of, of Amareth Moll and Maria Pua de la Balacasa, an ongoing development of this care ethic can be seen. These authors move into a post-human theoretical space, exploring the idea of care as relational within the human and the more than human areas of techno-science in the case of Moll and nature cultures in the case of um, Pua de la Balacasa. So for Moll, in her ethnography of diabetes clinics, um, Care is in this tension, and a, it's a logic, and it's a tinkering. So it's a relationship between the medical staff who know and understand their patients and their patients' conditions, and their patients' experience of their disease, and how that the, um, the technology that, you, you know, diabetes, you know, you prick your finger, you know, that's the part of the, the technological part of the relationship, and then there's blood sugar measuring and all that sort of stuff. So how do all of these things fit together to provide the best care? For, for, the, for the patient. And in the case of um, um, Pure de la Balacasa, it's actually a really beautiful book, this one. Highly recommend it, if it, both of them actually. Um, Amaret Moll's book and this one. Really highly recommend them if you're interested in more reading. Um, um, so in the case of Moll, it's about soil and nature cultures in, the, in terms of permaculture. She, she writes quite a lot about um, her experiences of permaculture and um, her affection for worms. Um, in, in the soil and compost. So both Moll and Puig de la Balcasa note the messiness of care. They, they, their research is within science, okay, but as, as, um, as Puig de la Balacasa points out, care is unthinkable as something abstracted from its situatedness. It's a really important point. And to link back to the point 
in the previous slide from um, um, Dwayne Donald and by Zoe Todd, an ethically responsive care is situated. Okay? It's situated, it's messy, and it's located in histories. It's not a simple, straightforward process. So looking at care from many angles and locations actually sends you off in all sorts of directions and possibilities. And this is by no means an exhaustive map of where I've been and the kinds of readings I've been doing um, and my travels <laughs> along this landscape. Um, but it's kind of an indication. So the uses of care zigzag all over the place and it's a massive and complex field. And this is actually um, my Nan's crochet in the background. And I, I, I kind of, I don't know, I just thought that this was a metaphor, right? Because to me it's just like this zigzaggy mess because I can't crochet. But um, um, it's, it's kind of this, this, this interweaving in, in the background there. So Vincent and Ball talk about care and class. So they, wrote, they did a wonderful study in the early 2000s about middle class women looking for care for their children so that they could go back to work. So they talk about care and class. Fraser talks, Nancy Fraser, she talks about a crisis in care. Sandra Acker has been talking about care for many, many, many years, since the mid-90s. Ari Huschild talked about global care chains. The, um, the women, for example, in the Philippines who might leave their own families at home, travel to places like Hong Kong and Saudi Arabia to care for other women's children, wealthier women's children. Um, nurturing care is a new document from UNICEF. Um, a pedagogy of care with Jean Rockle. Um, also, Carmen Daly in here in Auckland um, has written about care. Care work, matters of care, that's the Pua Gila Balakasa book. Logic of care. Market in love, which I think is a really neat phrase. That's Carol Vincent's phrase. This peculiar market of love we have. Lisa Goldstein, teaching with love, professional love particularly reflective emotional professionals. Um, landscapes of care is geography. So we've been traveling all over the place. Um, right. So I'm actually breaking a rule tonight. Usually when I give a presentation, I have three key points. I talk about them and I go the out of there. Um, but tonight I'm kind of doing a bit more of a, a Miranda, meandering sort of um, picking things up and putting them down again sort of thing. So I'm, I'm kind of sticking with my crochet metaphor. I'm going to pick up some threads and then kind of just put them down again. And I know how I think they all thread together. But I wanted to leave some spaces open for, for you to be thinking about how you see them threading together. OK, so yet another firefighter story. So I don't know if any of you remember, but about 10 years ago, actually it was the 10-year anniversary this year in January, in 2009, there were the Black Friday fires in Victoria. Many, many, I think about 170 people were, were killed in those fires. And um, it was incredibly distressing, of course. And the firefighters came across this koala, and she couldn't. She was trying to run away from them, but she couldn't because her paws were hurt. Okay, so she couldn't move. And um, as someone took a photo of this firefighter, giving her a drink. Okay, and he's holding his hand there. He's putting his arm on her hand, and it's beautiful. It's such a beautiful photo, and it became very famous in Australia. And actually, there's a sculpture of that image, and it was widely used for fundraising and all sorts of things. And um, that's the first story. The second story is, of course, for the second photo there, uh, we've got some doozies. A couple of years ago in Australia, a conservative sen senator um, described early childhood educa educators as, you know, all they, all they do is wipe snotty noses and make sure the kids don't kill each other. And um, you know, imagine the reaction in the field to that one. Um, it was swift and it was articulate, okay? And there is now um, a, um, a campaign again for um, better pay, for better conditions, for equal pay, for you know, all of those things that we know about. Um, but my question then, of course, is whose care counts? And I'm, I'm talking to a university audience, so I'm pretty sure that it's obvious in, that my point is that it's male care that takes strength, right? Not female care as far as these go, this, this, these stories go. So who's caring counts and who's caring has a value? Okay, what is it about firefighters, and I'm sure we could tell you, but it may not make the recording, <laughs> um, that enable us to lord their care, okay, in this way? Why is it that their care is so worthy and so special, so strong, that, but the everyday care provided by women all over the world is just assumed? It's just wiping snotty noses, just making sure the kids don't kill each other. 
Firefighters in Australia can exchange their labour for far more than early childhood educators. The entry level firefighting pay level is 10,000 Australian dollars more than entry level early childhood educator salary. Okay. So there's a clearly some gendered histories here and, um, and there's definitely a story to be told there. Okay. So that's, one, that's my first little thread. Here's another one. Okay. Across many of the writers, exploring an ethic of care is this theme of power and care it, and this, this idea of power being messy and specific and lots of challenges to the idea of a connection with a feminine, feminine, feminine ideal of good care. So there's this perceived connection between, between care and good is also contested. Care being discussed as ranging from positive to negative, oppressive, sometimes stressful, Okay, Moll, for example, asks us, and this is a quote, to disentangle care from an all too immediate association with kindness, dedication, and generosity. Furthermore, care can illuminate relationships of power and privilege. For example, considering who undertakes routine care work. Who can afford someone else to pay someone else to do this work? And the level of non and or underpayment of this work highlights the way in which paid and unpaid care work is devalued and often precarious while also being gendered and classed and raced. Selma, Selma Seven Husen asserts here that people with power are more often in a position to receive or demand care than to provide it. And conversely, people with less social power often find themselves on that underside of care. That is in situations in which they provide care without much power over the condition and, and the means, and often in positions of invisibility and voicelessness. So engaging with the power on, of care and the privilege of care also then can help us start to can think about the marginalization of these non-dominant conceptualizations of care. When the power and privilege and politics of care is opened up, it might become something it might become more possible to take care with care. And going back to Donald, to being ethically reciprocal. Okay, here's another thread. So neoliberal markets commodify all aspects of our lives. It's very, very, very difficult to get off grid in a real way. Markets require competition. Markets require scarcity, that's how they work. They are built on a citizen who is an individual, autonomous, rational, and can I just say clean, not messy, not requiring care because that's already been done in the background by a woman, okay? So our capitalist, neoliberal market economies and societies are built on consumption and creating more and more things to consume, which is also requiring more and more people to do the consuming. And whose body gets to consume and whose body gets to be disposal is a whole nother thread, which I won't talk about tonight. So in this environment of scarcity and con competition, the idea of care can become commodified. Children become precious assets. Okay. Um, and profits and dividends are the priority. In Australia, for-profit early childhood settings are dominant. I'm not sure in the, in the New Zealand context, but making a profit from caring for kids is what, how the field functions. In the UK context, um, Carol Vincent has called this a peculiar market in love which is a really nice phrasing, I think. So trying to untangle this peculiar market in love raises the complexities of our relationships and our affects. We are all entangled in this together. We create these conditions, as Haraway said, we are sympoetic making with, okay? We are tentacular. We are part of this relationship. As Rosie Bredotti expresses it, we are into this together, but we are not one. And we can ask whose children get to become these precious children don't. Okay. Another thread. So as I've stayed with troubling this word care, I've been struck by how often this simple word, this easily assumed, used without much care or thought, can be deeply opaque actually and obscure. Okay. It's assumed as understood. It's assumed as natural. It's assumed as straightforward and not worthy of or in need of definition or debate. So I have been wondering if the very ease in which care can be used potentially renders the word empty and meaningless. 
care becomes an assumed good in early childhood, much the same way in the past play has been. It's assumed to be there and assumed to be part of what a good early childhood educator does. But I really want to argue that it's dangerous to assume that we know these words, these portmanteau words that have so many little pockets and spaces for meanings to hide within. So this quote comes from research, some research I did. It, it was a few years ago now, back in 2012, and I'm obviously using it for a different purpose here. But one of, it was researching um, relationships between parents and early childhood educators. And one of the key threads between all of the interviews with parents and, well, with mothers and with early childhood educators was this word care. It came up in pretty much every interview. So this is an interviewee who is a trainee early childhood educator. So she's probably doing a certificate three at TAFE. I'm not sure what your recruitment here would be, but the very, very, very beginnings. And she's talking about what, what it means to have a relationship. What does she her, see her job being in building relationships um, in, in working with parents? And this is one part of her response. Yeah, talking about care. OK. but. Then there's, oops, the wrong one. In the same set of interviews, this one happened. And this was the one that I really sat with for a long time. And this is the one that got me stopping and thinking, I have to stay with this trouble. So this is the, a director of one of the sites I worked with. And she said, I personally think, OK, it's really going out on a limb here. Some of these children are in care too long. The parent who knocks off work at three o'clock and doesn't pick up their child until quarter to six, we're actually starting to get a bit tougher on it. And we did do a lot of talking about it before it was decided. Same staff as the person in the previous slide doing that talking. And it was fairly unanimous amongst the staff that it was, well, it was unacceptable. We've actually started to say to some parents, we're mindful that you don't work on a Tuesday and you've got your child in care, that's fine, but they are not to stay here until quarter to six. We want them picked up at 4.30. And we can do it now, I suppose, because we're full. We can be a little harder about it. So I did stay with this quote for a very long time. And tonight, I just want to say that the director's position of power as a leader here and provider of a service in what is a scarce and competitive and peculiar market in love enables her to make this judgment and to enact that judgment about being a little bit harder about it. The child is judged to be in early childhood setting for too long. And this judgment functions to position the early childhood educator and her colleagues, including the trainee on the previous slide, as more caring than the mother. And this is then juxtaposed with the poor care and a deficit of care provided by the mother, because we are definitely talking about a mother here. The implication is that the mother doesn't care enough. She's lazy. She's not providing adequate or appropriate care, even perhaps that she doesn't want to provide that care. And this is framed within the rhetoric of paid work as the only excuse for having a child in an early childhood setting, which is actually a reflection of the dominant debate in Australia. And this is one illustration, I think, of this paradoxical way in which care can be thought about in early childhood. You know, do you remember Dr. Doolittle's Push Me Pull You? You know, the llama with two heads, right? Um, that this statement of care uh, um, for a child can be manipulated in this way as a front for judging and controlling the parent's behavior, pushing and pulling in different ways. And it always stuns me when early childhood educators take this stance, when they feel righteous about children as if they're the most important arbiters of that child's life, when the reality is they are not the ones that are up at 2 a.m. making decisions about going to emergency with an ill child. Once the child goes to school, it's very temporal. They're gone, right? So they're important in, 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 a in, a in a specific moment they are important. But in the scheme of things, it's a different story. Okay, and then this is a good example, I think, of Selva Selma Seven Hughes and John Tronto's point that institutional care is not family care, that there are significant differences in how care gets enacted in early childhood settings and how care gets enacted in family settings. They're different relationships. They're different entanglements. OK. OK. Final little thread. But it's important to emphasize, I think, that the right care at the right moment requires a responsiveness and sensitivity that should, recognize, should be recognized as serious professional work. It requires networks of relationships with children caring about each other about adults, about the world, 
and about adults doing the same. When good relationships and pedagogical interactions occur, they're most likely to be based in caring relationships. Attention to the place of care in our work can be political, pushing back against that neoliberal cascade that Ray Connell talks about in education where care is diminished and the focus is upon individuals who are autonomous and rational citizens rather than education as an encounter between complex and fragile human beings. Like Moll's diabetes clinics, it is a tinkering. It's a logical thinking, a little shuffle, a dance, an interplay of teachers, children and families, adjusting, playing, tinkering to support children's learning. And in early childhood education, this is often subtle work, recognising children's cues and seeking constant feedback from them, particularly with not pre-verbal children. You know, you're recognising the slightest cues about their interactions with you. Finding ways to express the importance of care in all its complexity and specificity is vital in our current environment of ungenerous neoliberalism. This will entail exploring the significant levels of professional knowledge, decision making and ongoing reflection required for, building and, and, for the building and sustenance of caring relationships with colleagues, with families and with children. It also entails to facing up to how care might function neg negatively okay, and acknowledging the potential of, of care to be a form of oppression. As um, Zygmunt here and her colleagues suggest, care can be a powerful force in disrupting the ways in which schooling is done in and to historically marginalised communities. And again, we come back to Dwayne Donald's point about ethical relational relationality. We need to recognise histories, social location, and to not deny differences. So, um, in a recent paper, I think it's just this year or maybe the end of last year, Teresa As Aslanian wrote a paper on the loss of the language of care in a recent review of the Norwegian um, Early Childhood Teacher Education Accreditation Authority's review of their policy. So the language of care has been removed from this policy. And this is a quote from that paper. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's another example of this kind of Dr. Doolittle push me pull you thing and these entanglements with neoliberal agendas. We really are offered up a poisoned chalice here. Okay, so as Lenian, as Lenian says, as opposed to the subjects of learning, play and development, care was described in interviews as quasi or soft subject that we cannot be quantified, measured or tested. Illustrated by one interview, these comments that care falls exactly because of difficult things like the demand to measure. How can you measure love? So on the one hand, here is us to gain political and professional recognition, we must actively emphasize our educational credentials, okay? Often strategically, linking ourselves to that economic cost-benefits analysis or neuroscience, trying to scientifically prove that the early years matter and matter critically in order to make the case for our qualifications, for our funding and for our fair work conditions. However, silencing care in this equation leaves us personally and professionally diminished. In its most positive forms, early childhood education and care enables a community of people who learn together to understand, to engage with and participate in, um, in the human and the non-human world around them, to care for their patch on the planet, to care about learning and to be excited by the possibilities this offers. Thinking about this issue of care in early childhood education and care is growing. It's been there for the last 20 years or so, but definitely on the margins. But it's been expanding, I think, quite rapidly in the last five years or so in particular. So just in the last two years, there have been two special issues in journals on care. So I did one at the end of 2018 in Global Studies for Childhood. Jules Page did one last year. There's an edited book coming out this year with Mark and Sonia um, Arndt have a chapter in that book. Okay, so suddenly there's this real focus, an explicit focus on care in early childhood. And I would suggest that it is in this moment of evanescence that an idea becomes thinkable. So it's through the diminishing of the language of care. So evanescence is about the disappearance of an idea. So it is through the diminishing of a language of care, the fall of care, that care actually, that we seem to be grasping for it to return hopefully in a robust and defensible word, way. In other words, it is in this moment of potential disappearance that care becomes thinkable, that it opens up and is mobile and malleable and gives us the opportunity to critically re-engage. Hey, we have the opportunity to ask that most Foucauldian of questions, 
How do we come to be as we are today? And then follow up with the Deleuzian sort of Braidotian question of how do we seek to be worthy of these times? So I'd like to conclude then with a bit of a mangling of Rosie Braidotti. Rosie regularly asserts that in the critical social sciences and humanities, we are not the soft sciences, we are the subtle ones. We are the ones with complexity built in. And I would like to suggest that actually in early childhood, we are not the soft educators. We are the subtle ones. We are the ones with complexity built in. So I wonder instead of thinking of care as the soft aspect of the work, our work, we can think of it as the subtle and complex part of our work. After all, care plays out in relationships of power and politics. And to engage carefully with this aspect of our work in deep and reflective ways requires critical and subtle thought. We are always already entangled in responsive and complex relationships with children, with families, with each other. We are always already entangled and embodied in those daily practices in early childhood education. To think with care requires openness to this complexity and subtlety. And we have been thinking with care always, already, even if we haven't been always particularly articulate about that. So to practice in early childhood requires us to think about how to be worthy of this world. And returning to the very beginning of my talk, we must think about how we are in this together, but we are not one, of how we are dependent on each other in entangled and tentacular knots, that we are more than ever before at any other time in human history exposed to one another. Because care matters, care takes strength, care is about power, and care is political. It is gendered, it's classed, it's raced, it's all of these things that can be oppressive. But if we are to live well in the world, then responsive, thoughtful, and ethically engaged care is absolutely necessary. An understanding of care that is a form of ethical relationality, to return to Dwayne Donald's quote from the beginning, that is located and specific within histories and social contexts that recognizes difference rather than denying them. That is a care that encompasses our shared and fragile humanity. And for me, this is how we become worthy of our times and worthy of our world. Thank you. I think, I think in, in my experience, at least in my reading, the idea of care in schools is even more marginalised than early childhood education. You know, and um, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily use the word privilege there. I'd sort of maybe talk more about things that teachers do that are silenced or invisible rather than um, privilege. Yeah. Because um, I think teachers, teachers do that work. I mean, my sister, my sister's a secondary teacher and she keeps uh, um, one of one of the one of the cupboards in her classroom is full of food, like one minute noodles and things like that. And the kids know that if they need it, they take it. You know. So this is stuff that teachers do all the time. Um, um, it's just that in non -early, in early childhood settings, it's almost invisible and not discussed and not valued. So I think in other education contexts, it's even less just you know discussion and valuing of, of that work. So the transition is hard. I, I, I think I have a friend in, in um, Edinburgh who, who runs um, Cowgate under fives. Fantastic early childhood setting. Just beautiful, rebellion um, inspired setting. And she's won many awards for this place. And um, she oftentimes has children and families who come back and go, it's so hard at school because it's so different. And yeah. Transition's hard. She actually wrote her PhD about the transition.
outcome. That's the, the professionalisation of that element of care. What happened is that a small number of counsellors at ENT were, were, were flooded <laughs> yes. with these mature teachers that we've been working with and now yeah. we've got them up to. Yeah. Um, so then they said, oh, well, in that case, we need to work out what counsellors' real moments of care required by us as professionals and, and, the, and the not so real ones or the most important ones, which they then turned back to our allied staff, our receptionists, and said, well, you can deal with those. Um, and, and all that, I think, comes around the idea of there's some people who are more able to measure those kinds of, and, you know, recognise what's important and what's not important to care. So, so the key thing, I think, from, for me from your work is not, not to suggest care, but that care can be measured in those ways. Because no. this is the absurdity of that even just Yeah, yeah. Or you get up, you end up like in Norway with Professor um, Aslanian, where it just just is it made more and more invisible because it can't be measured. Yeah, it, it, yeah. I think I think the idea of trying to measure it is is yeah an absolute nonsense. We can't go there at all. Yeah. But we, I think we do have to find a vocabulary for it, and I think that there's genuinely a space there, and there's genuinely a moment where we actually talking to each other about this idea of care and how do we how do we find a good language for understanding what it is we do that's care and caring and why it's important which is different to measuring <laughs> um, and, it, and, and in the end it actually becomes quite an emotional yes. thing where people realise that the person's not just in trouble because they're a shit stirrer and whatever, you know, stuff like that. But I think going with Deleuze a little further, there's also a very big danger of too much clarity. Yeah. So in the tentacular <laughs> of, Such a great word, isn't it? Um, and all of the other The and situatedness. Not the way recognize, which then yes. you know perhaps yes. that people are, uh, are producing the, the new events worthy of our time. But, so I suppose the short point was I feel that once you make a commitment to move away from fixed identities, representation, transcendent truths, as the talk was going, and you move into the more open. And it will be mobile, and it will be situated and messy and complicated, which is, I think, why it's important to stay subtle and to stay, yeah. And that's why I think that the mobile concepts are, are, are useful for thinking through some of these words. Mm. Yeah. Not actually looking for a definition, looking for multiple definitions and understanding how it looks different.
Yes. I think it would be really interesting to see different ways that um, um, different locations start to explore and, and, and create their caring relationships. Yeah. I think, was it in the 70s that nested language happened in New Zealand? The language nest, the Maori nest? 80s, was it? Yes. To the point now where you can have a, a bilingual um, policy doc curriculum document. And, and I've been thinking about how to articulate care for, for a little while. It's very hard, actually. It's not, a, it's not going to be an easy task in front of us, this, this articulation of what, what, what does this actually even mean? Because it's not just about wiping a snotty nose, right? Um, and it's not just about growing a plant. It's, it's, it is, it's much more technical than this, much more technical. And you're playing with feelings and emotions. Yes, yes. Enormous amount, yes. And I noticed that when I first started reading around care, that there's so much in health and nursing. Yeah. There's just so much written about care and the work of care in the everyday practices of, of nurses and medical staff. But then that's kind of like the same point of view point of view as well, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, I know. I, I have been thinking about that one too, about why is it, if, if nursing is predominantly feminized in Australia as well, um, most of the world I would imagine, is why are they, why are they talking about care and, and able to prioritize care in the way that they do? And I was wondering also if it's linked to aged care and the fact that they're talking about adults. And maybe there's a generational issue as well. Uh, an issue of, of a valuing of adults over I haven't really thought that one through carefully yet, but the, you know, I was wondering that because in Australia at the moment there's um, a royal commission into aged care, so there's government government investigation into aged care because of all sorts of awful things that have been coming to light in, in aged care, but there's never been any suggestion that should, there should be a royal commission into early childhood, and there's some pretty horrendous things that happen you know, that get reported. I was wondering if there's the gendered aspect to that. I think that might also be a generational aspect. Maybe. I don't know. Just Maybe thinking it through.
Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, and definitely there's the hierarchies between. Yeah. I just wrote down two key points that I got out of the talk that perhaps you can think about as you move away from here. But one of the points is that care is fundamental to our lives, um, but as a concept, it's not always used with care or with careful thinking. That's what I learned from you. Another point that I wrote down was that care is complex, multifaceted, and highly contested, but we need to care about it in order to critically engage with it. Um, and I think what Joanne has done today is proffered ideas that could make a whole dictionary of care. <laughs> um, but you cert you've certainly challenged us to think about care in many different ways, through different lenses, um, and with different experiences in mind, both personal and in relation to others. So thank you for that. It was thank you. Uh, refueling in many, many ways. Yeah, awesome. Thank Please, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.